שלום וברוכים הבאים לכנס TEDx עירוני D High School. קודם כל, לפני שנתחיל, מבקשים לשים את הטלפונים על שקט. ועידת TED, ראשי תיבות באנגלית של Technology Entertainment Design, כלומר, טכנולוגיה בידור עיצוב, היא ועידה אקדמית שנתית העוסקת במגוון רחב של נושאים, בהם מדע, אומנות, עיצוב, חינוך, תרבות, עסקים, טכנולוגיה ועוד. המוטו של הוועידה הוא Ideas Work Spreading, כלומר רעיונות ששווה להפיץ. אני נורית, ואני אלה, ואנחנו תלמידות בכיתת ט' מחוננים בבית הספר עירוני ד'. בחצי שנה האחרונה, חברינו לכיתה ואנו, חווינו למידה מעט שונה. תחת משבצת השיעור פרויקט, בחרנו להביא כנס ט' איקס משלנו. התחלקנו לחמישה צוותים. היי, מי נאמר מל. And I'm a think between boxaholic. עירוני די היי סקול. לאחר חשיבה מרובה ובנק נושאים שהצענו, בחרנו בהצבעה הכיתתית את הנושא של הכנס שלנו, חינוך וחברה. בחרנו בנושא החינוך מכיוון שהוא קרוב לליבנו ומהווה חלק חשוב מהחיים שלנו כל עוד אנחנו חלק ממערכת החינוך הזאת. ראינו בכנס זה את ההזדמנות שלנו לשמוע, ללמוד, להעשיר את עצמנו ואת סביבתנו בנושא הקרוב ביותר והמשפיע ביותר על חיינו כיום. בנושא החברה בחרנו גם כן מכיוון שהוא משפיע רבות עלינו, מכיוון שאנחנו חלק מחברה ישראלית. בכלל, נושא החברה משפיע על כל הנשים שחיים בעולם שלנו, ונושא החינוך והחברה הם נושאים שמאוד קשורים ואי אפשר להפריד ביניהם. נושא זה העלה בנו תהיות כגון אילו בעיות יש במערכת החינוך שלנו, לאן החברה שלנו מתפתחת ואם בכלל, והאם אפשר לייצר חוויית למידה קצת שונה בכיתות. ועכשיו, אחרי שדיברנו הרבה, שנתחיל? ובכן, המרצה הראשון שלנו היום הוא פרופסור מל רוזנברג, מדען שפרסם למעלה ממאה מאמרים מדעיים, כתב ספרים ופיתח המצאות שזכו להצלחה בינלאומית. בצד הקריירה האקדמית, הוא עוסק במוזיקה ובכתיבת ספרי ילדים, הקים את המיזם האינטרנטי לספרים Hourbooks, ומלמד חשיבה יצירתית במרכז הטכנולוגי בחולון. היי, that it's almost impossible to find the glue. Ah, and then you find the glue. So let's start with an exercise. You see Haya on the left and Haya on the right. But the Haya on the right is actually Nua. That's because it's a different frame of thought, a different point of reference. That's actually letters from the Cyrillic Russian. And it's Nuzhna, which, who knows, it might be a Russian princess or a salami sandwich. <clears throat> Here we have two white boxes. Well, you were students, so you're probably looking at the one on the left and thinking it might be an exam paper, and the one on the right is your cheat sheet. I sometimes think that uh, students, we teach them to be creative uh, because they try and cheat on exams sometimes. Not that you do it, but you know, some students do it. Um, but The point of reference for a Canadian like me who's finished school is I look at this and I, on the left I see a window in Canada in February. <laughs> and on the right I see the same window one year later. <laughs> so it doesn't have to be a frame of thought, it can be anything. It can be two states of mind, two disciplines, categories, actions, culture, pictures and words, and of course you're allowed to mix and match. And when they are completely different, we try and find the unexpected connection between them. Uh, and inventors do it for profit and fun. I've been very lucky in my career to be able to do both. Um, um, as an inventor, I was able to invent a two-phase mouthwash with water and oil 
that are supposed to be incompatible, and we found a way to shape it. Because the other box that I love is to take things and to shape them, turn them upside down. Uh, we invented a, uh, a spray. This is just any ordinary spray, but when you put a shoe on it and turn, turn it over, it becomes a shoe spray that you just press inside. Unfortunately, it explodes once in a while, so it never made it big on the commercial market. But the mouthwash did. We invented a mouthwash with water and oil that captures bacteria and takes them out of the mouth, and it became quite successful. Um, and that's for profit and for fun. I write children's books. I'm not a famous children's book writer, but my books are all about uh, animals and, and children learning to cope with different frames of thought. And very often they have to learn to turn upside down to solve their problem or to shake like uh, Tim the porcupine in this story. You'll see that he, he does use the right brand of mouthwash though. <laughs> and when you put them side by side, you see that Science and literature are not that different. Right. So, most people talk about thinking outside the box, and they have been for 30 or 40 years. And in fact, if you Google thinking outside the box, you'll find over one million search results. I don't know what it means. When you think outside the box, where are you? There's a big universe out there. And uh, even if the box is very big, it's a huge field or discipline of learning, it's a bigger universe out there. And then, of course, there's other people uh, who think inside the box, maybe some chemists, for example, all of chemistry is in a giant box. You can do an experiment, and if it doesn't work with nickel, you can try chromium or cadmium. Uh, and a quarter of a million search results for thinking inside the box. You can't think inside the box, but that excludes everything outside the box. So I believe in thinking between boxes. Uh, for better or for worse, there's only 58 search results, and one of them is mine together with Dr. Alon Amit. So either I'm very intrepid or equally foolhardy. But let's have a look at thinking between boxes. A very young talk will, will take a, a bottle of something and look at the cap and call it a door. And actually that's quite unusual because it does open, it does close, but we say to the young talk, well, hey, you know, we, we call that a bottle cap, right? And as we grow a bit older, and we're still very young children, we have to learn to categorize everything uh, in order to survive. <laughs> on the left, you see a ferocious, hungry lion. And on the right, you see a tall tree that you can climb. So we put the tall, we put the hungry lion into the box of the ferocious, deadly animals, and we put the tree into the leafy, tall things that you can climb. Okay? So, and you don't want to get these boxes mixed up with one another, right? You don't want to escape from a tree and climb on the back of a hungry lion. Uh, and then we go to school. And in school, we're, we're, we, we're taught that everything is dichotomous. And you know what a dichotomy is. Either you know what a dichotomy is, or you don't. That's a dichotomy. Um, and we learn in school that there are teachers and there are pupils, and the teachers tell us what is correct and what is wrong, and if something is wrong, then it can't be correct, can it? We learn that there's white and that there's black. We learn that most of us are lucky to be right-handed, I'm not, and the rest of us are sinister. Uh, we learn that you're either Jewish or you're not Jewish, and if you are Jewish, then perhaps you keep kosher, but you don't keep kosher if you eat cream of lobster soup. You're either a child or an adult. You're either a male or a female. Uh, you're either humorous or serious. I could go on and on. If you're a Beatles fan, you like John or Paul. If you like saxophone, you're into alto sax or tenor sax. So many examples of different boxes that appear to be dichotomous. And of course, if you believe in Peter Pan, and we all have to, otherwise we'll never fly, um, and you look at those pictures, as I did as a child, well, you know, either Peter Pan and Captain Hook like, look like the guys on the right or the left. They can't look like both, right? Um, and if you like oats, you don't like lot, you don't like ivy, and that's because mares eat oats and does eat oats, 
but little lambs eat ivy. And of course, you study mathematics, four cannot be equal to 11, can it? I mean, that's, that's dichotomy for you. It turns out, however, that life is not dichotomous. I'm almost dichotomous, I'm anti-dichotomous. Because most things are not mutually exclusive. There's black and white, and as we all know, many shades of gray. <laughs> and somebody who apparently loved alto and tenor sax invented the C melody sax, which plays in between them. And of course, you go to school and you're either in history class or you're in geography class, but that's kind of ridiculous because how can you study history without geography and vice versa? Uh, and I know families from my Canadian days who keep kosher during the week, but on the weekend they order in Chinese food on disposable plates. <laughs> and a lot of people who deal with uh, creativity and invention think that essentially it's a two-step process. There's two steps in inventing something. There's, first of all, the adult who knows how to solve problems, and, but there's also the child who knows how to ask the crazy questions, to dream big, to dream the impossible. And then the adult looks at the child within us and says, hey, you know that wacky idea? I know how to solve it. And that is where most inventions come from. And to go back to discuss 4 and 11, as any mathematician knows, if you like to think in base 3, then 4 is actually 11. 1, 2, 10, 11. So what I've come to believe is that everything is, is connected with everything else. And what we have to do is we have to find those crazy connections in order to be invented. And I'm a microbiologist, so I love yogurt. And I challenge my students to compare yogurt with anything, to find me anything that is not created, not associated with yogurt. So one of my students last week said, the moon. The moon isn't associated with yogurt. But of course it is, because there might be bacteria on the moon. You can send the yogurt into orbit. And of course, yogurt is made out of milk products. And of course, so is the moon, except it gets nibbled every month by hungry mice. Oh, mice! There's nothing between yogurt and mice. Oh, but if we Google it, there's 257,000 connections. Oy vey. <laughs> and one of them is very interesting. A recent science report says that mice become very virile after they've eaten yogurt. Go no. Uh, and of course, I've written a story about a child whose mother thinks he loves yogurt because he wants to be healthy and strong, but actually he is keeping the empty cups to put his musical mice to hide them at night from his parents. <laughs> so somebody suggested wound care. How could there be anything connecting yogurt and wound care? Well, almost half a million search results. So essentially, the only option left to me was to sit last night and to think about binoculars. I mean, there's, there's nothing connecting yogurt and binoculars, is there? But there is. Somebody has invented binoculars that you make from recycled yogurt cups. And I tell my son, who says to me, how can you invent anything? There's so many things that are invented already. And there are. We're going to have the U.S. patent number 9 million soon. But the thing is, every year there are about 20,000 more new patents than there were the previous year. So every year there are more inventions, not less. And I would like, of course, my kids and students to be one of them. So as your homework, it's easy to start out with taking words. And what you can do is you can take one word, which is a field of thought, and another word, and take two that have nothing to do with each other, they do, of course, and you can Google it. But I took icicle and sanatorium because I like to play with words. And I came up with a new word, which is called an isecutorium, which is where you go when you want to recover from damp an area. 
um, the, the, the fun, Lewis Carroll did this 150 years ago when he wrote Jabberwocky, and some of those words that he invented from other words actually became words in the English language. But what Lewis Carroll didn't have was what we have, and that's Wikipedia. We can, or Google, we can, we can take any new word that we've invented and see whether it exists on the internet. So I invented Icecutorium the other day, and within a day or two, you can go on the internet and find my new word. Um, my time is up. You have two boxes to think between. Have fun. Thank you.